I'm here to save you. Save you from the potential pitfall of wrapping the tips inside curves because when the sinew dries it'll want to pull up and so you have to support this if you have an indentation right here and you have the sinew going down the sides a little bit I guarantee you, once that sinew really starts yanking back when it's curing it'll pull off of that so you have to support every possible inside curve if this was recurved it needs to have wrap there before the sinew starts ah, drying. And so I see that people do wrap. They'll sinew wrap. Personally, like a old bow making friend of mine taught me, there's only one kind of sinew and that's white tail deer. It's not true. You can use a wide variety of sinews, but I like this stuff. It's not greasy. If you use elk, for example, it's great. You don't need to prepare as many tendons, but it's on the greasy side. Whereas this seems to have been made for sinew backing. You don't need to degrease it. It's nice and fluffy. It sticks well. It's wonderful stuff. It doesn't need to be super long. Although I have to say that these are good size. You might be asking me, what about back straps in you? Well, I bought three of them. Five dollars a piece. Why did I buy them if I'm not going to use them for backing the bow? I'm not going to use them because they're very, very expensive. If I was making a highly stressed horn bow, Asiatic style, European style, I would take every advantage and use these long fibers. But I use this for fletching arrows because when I'm putting the, the feathers on, I do a spiral wrap through them and this is so much easier when you can use just one length of sinew instead of tying it together in the case of the shorter sections. I like to use this for wrapping tips and again the handle sections and everywhere else I need to wrap because believe it or not even though this came from the same animal it's a handy tip. Back strap will look different than the leg tendon sinew and so when you wrap tips with it you're going to get a good you're going to get a good uh, difference in looks. I'm not going to waste time trying to find my big boy words. What's really cool is the difference in looks between white-tailed deer, leg tendons for backing, and bison, buffalo, backstrap sinew. And I made many a cool little horse bow, Galwang, Osage, Usually I made more Osage horse bows than I have others. Leg tendon. Mid limb. I would have a mid limb wraps. Um, snake skin in the center to mid limb wrap, followed by buffalo on either side wraps. And then X pattern. X pattern. I'd go so far as either to recurve them or use bent tabs which is not an authentic method but boy it does look cool rawhide hand wrap followed by a narrow bison wrap rattlesnake and then another those really nice looking bows um, but where I'm going with this is when do you wrap this is supported I unwrapped it this morning looked at it nice wrapped it as tight as I possibly could after a certain amount of time there's no way I'm gonna get the sinew to shift so I can just I can bear down on it like Gary the gorilla just ah, tighten this thing on really support it I could unwrap it and it would be fine but I'm supporting it so there's absolutely no in extra wraps right here because it's narrow and then it gets wide don't want that to pull off in any way shape or form right here when I do my recurves, after I shorten them, I've got two recurves to do, five bend bows, gull wing and then recurves. I'll also wrap that recurve so it doesn't pull away from it. But I will support it to a point where it's dry before I wrap it. And why is that? You can go to YouTube videos, how to send you back, and 
they have the typical like double boiler and then the little bundles that they'll put on, which is fine. The majority of sinew backbows roaming the, the world today were done that way and it works. I just use less glue just, just because. I don't need to have that much, so I just use less. It's easier. I don't need to bother with a hot plate, um, lower viscosity. It will gel if it gets down below 65 degrees. That's my tipping point for glue viscosity. But I'm not going to wrap the tip like some of the people telling you how to do it will immediately. I'm not going to send you back it and then wrap the tips. Why? Because this will shrink down. And why are you going to wrap the tips on a area that's going to get smaller? It's not going to bond as well. You want it to shrink down as far as possible before you wrap it. It'll, it'll just make a tighter, nicer wrap. I've literally done like a three-layer ball, wrap the tips right away, and when it dries, you can see it's buckling here because the backing shrunk. The bow got smaller. You, you get my meaning here. Now, you can send you back a bow, let it dry all the way. I mean, horn bow makers do this. Add another layer, let it dry all the way, add another layer, as many layers as you do. You can dry it. But there are ways of doing that. I've done that after I take a wet rag or something like that, a clean one, wipe or I sand it. I want to scarf it up, just like I'm sizing the bow. Scarf it up, then wipe it. Let it sit. Wipe it. Let it sit. And I'm not getting the water deep in, just on the surface, until it gets a little tacky again. And I've literally gone into the bathroom, run the hot water in the shower, and steam the heck out of that room so I'm, I'm seeing you back in, in a steamy place. Because the possibility of delamination when you're seeing you backing over a previously dried sinew backing, adding a second layer over, the possibility of delamination is high. That is tricky. That's why I don't let it dry all the way before I get all my layers on. I do them all at once. I'll send you back one layer. Then I'll let it sit a while so it dries enough so when I put the second layer I can see where I left off. There will be a visual difference after an hour or so. Um, but I, I do a, another thing. Besides, then I'll, before I wrap this, it won't be 100% dry. It'll just be to the point where it's it's hard. It'll rehydrate relatively easy, easier than if I waited two months. I'll still sand it. I want to get where it went over the edge, you know, nice and stuff like that. I'll do some final sanding on the handle, blah, blah, blah. Sand the sinew where I'm going to sand you back. Wet it and wait. Wet it again. Hey, let that glue get tacky. Then... I will wrap it from the tip up. If I was to start here and go down, then the sinew will want to slip over the edge. But if you go from the narrow area to the bigger area, it'll support itself and you won't have visible separations there as, as much. Then this is the thing that you will, I don't think you'll hear it anywhere else. Anywhere else. I'll take a strip of a garbage bag and after I wrap that, wherever I wrap it, strip of garbage bag over it to keep it from drying. <laughs> I'll wrap it and I, want, I don't want it to dry. I want it to allow that moisture from that new wrapping to then bond to the surface below it. Let it sit overnight, whatever. It's a game of patience. You're going to have to wait a couple months anyway before your bow is done. Leave the garbage bag wrap on there. Then take it off and let it dry. And I've never had an issue with it peeling up. Now this is a question. Suppose you've wrapped your tips. That's the key. And then you go to redo your string grooves. You have string grooves in there. You tailored it. You know, whatever. Now if you're taking your round file and you're filing your string grooves in there and fibers pull up, that tells you that it's not stuck down that good. If, on the other hand, 
you're taking your round rasp and you're putting your string grooves in there and it just grinds away like a homogenous layer, then you know you've bonded it well. So you may doubt my words here as far as the garbage bag and the careful preparation and waiting and blah, blah, blah. But deep down in your heart of hearts, you know that if you're putting those string grooves in there and then you can take where it, where it pulled up from the rasp and you can peel it off, you done didn't get a good stick. I won't get that. It will be stuck. Now, I blend a lot of philosophy in my bows, and if you've read my descriptions, you realize that I'm not a fan of robots. I know how stupid that sounds. I know how stupid that sounds. I'm not a nut. But if you go to YouTube, robot says it doesn't believe in anything. Look at that scary monster, that aberration, that that mechanical creature, look at it. it. Doesn't believe in anything. It's hollow. It's just hollow. Now I'm gonna make a jump. Just like all of you, you bow people, you know that these things are more than just a thing. This is a bow. I just named it. And I I've got a very careful balance, this fine line, this razor's edge that I walk because of what I do. You know, whether it's in the teepee, which I'm not going to paint. I was told, John, it's fine that you have this, but don't paint it. You, you know what I mean, if you know what I mean. I've got a fine line to walk here. And so I'm not going to mention any specifics, really. Some things I will. I had a bowl of quinoa for breakfast quinoa eggs bacon which I didn't I wish I had eggs and bacon I had quinoa it comes from mountainous areas in Peru I'm pretty sure I blank a lot but in Peru the name for quinoa is mother you see it's not just I'm not just naming this thing I'm describing this thing and how it relates to me and that stupid robot has no clue just like the people that don't believe in anything. And I'm not saying you have to believe in this or this or this or this. You gotta believe in something. You know, whatever it is. Different strokes, different folks. But the Peruvians named this food mother for a reason. I'm describing it, not just naming it, I'm describing it, what it means to me. My relationship to this world has meaning because I believe in something more than that stupid robot and robot people that are roaming around trying to squirrel their way into the metaverse. Ugh, what an abomination. Mother, the name of this food. In the language, we'll call it a bow, we call it something else, what it means to them. This is a gift. The, the creature that fed them. You know, you might say, uh, look at definition, Tatanka. Now, I'm pronouncing that wrong. I am. And I realize that. But you look up definition of Tatanka, and you'll see buffalo. But is that truly what that word means? You know, just like gift, just like mother in the case of quinoa. You know, things have meanings. They're not just to be named. The important things in our lives. Like that goofy little furry creature meowing in there. <laughs> it's a meaning for me. I like them. I like their spirit. I like that they keep the mice out of the house. They serve a purpose. Think about that. Some things to think about. I guess that's it.